pick up here today. Let's get started talking about the kingdom. There's going to be a lot of information today. I'm going to take you on a ride. We're going to continue on, but today we're going to focus on rediscovering the keys of the kingdom. Okay? Let's first of all read a scripture. Jesus came to restore man to the kingdom of God. That's true. Luke chapter 4. Here's a statement made by Jesus about why he came. He said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I came. He was giving us his original purpose for coming to earth. Now please take notes today because you're going to remember this information. And make sure you go back and get the CDs from this whole conference. Don't walk away with one because you're going to have some problems connecting everything. And I don't want you to walk out of here with error. The purpose for this verse is to show you Jesus' specific re- ex- explanation as to why he came. Does he tell us? What does he say? I must spread the good news of the kingdom. That is why I came. It was the kingdom as his focus. All right. So why did Jesus come to earth? Well, Luke 12, 32. Write all the scriptures down, please. Important to read the scriptures. He said, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Again, my emphasis here is he is not pleased to give you a religion. We have reduced God's program to a religion called Christianity. When in fact he wanted to give us a whole kingdom. That's a serious statement. Religion focuses on getting you to heaven. The kingdom focuses on you taking over earth. Two different focuses. Religion is concerned about earth going to heaven. The kingdom is concerned about heaven coming to earth. Matter of fact, Jesus said very clearly, he says, the disciples asked him, what should we pray for? How should we pray? That was their question. He said, here's how to pray. Whenever you pray, always pray this. Our Father who is not on earth. (laughs) That's important. Because the Father doesn't want to come here. His territory is where? Heaven. Yeah? We read it early this week. Psalm 115, verse 15 and 16. The highest heaven belonged to the Lord, the earth he gave to man. So God is where? In heaven. He says, holy is your name. And then he said, pray this. Thy kingdom come and thy will, your desires be done where? On earth. How? Just like they are in heaven. In other words, God wants what's happening in heaven to happen on earth. But what we want to focus on is getting to heaven. All right. Let's talk about the value of the kingdom. Because we talk about the kingdom a lot this week. And I wanted to show you some scriptures to help to refocus your emphasis on the kingdom. Matthew 13, 45 says, again, Jesus is speaking. He's preaching to the public. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold what? Everything that he had and bought that one pearl. Now, remember that parables are little stories that conceal truth. So you got to really understand what they mean. This one is not too difficult to understand. He's saying that the kingdom of God has everything in it that you've been looking for. And that it is more valuable than anything else you could ever possess because everything else is in it. (laughs) That's why Jesus never focused on preaching prosperity. (laughs) He was focusing on how you could live in the midst of it forever. (laughs) If everything you need is in a house then all you got to do is what? Get in the house. Now you can stand outside and preach for 20 years about what's in the house. And that's what most believers are doing. 
and they're still broke. They can't pay their bills. They still got debt. They can't pay their mortgages off. They, they are suffering, and it's causing tension and pressure, growths and prostate cancer and breast cancer, all the stress. 98% of all diseases from stress, and Christians are the sickest. And the stress is from a desire for things because they won't go in the house. Yeah, hallelujah. I want to say some things, but I know you can't take it because you have too many questions when I leave. <laughs> Should I try? Yes. What do you think? Yes. Can I try? Yes. Okay, here's a statement. Take a deep breath. All right. Jesus is not the kingdom. Do you know what he is? The door. Doors lead to places. He says, what? I am the gate. Gate leads to places. He says, I am the way. Way leads to... See, we, we keep making him the end. He's not the end. He's the access. Most of us... Oh boy, I wonder if I could say this. Most of us have been living in the lobby, worshipping the door for 40 years. What's even worse, for the last 30 years, we've been preaching the door. Jesus never preached the door. He preached the house. Oh, boy. Okay, let me ask you a question. Let's be reasonable, okay? Reasonable. If you own a shoe store and you sell Fantastic shoes. I mean, gold slippers and silver boots. I mean, good stuff, you know, okay? And you get the store. And you want everybody in your community to come into that store to buy or to participate or enjoy those shoes. Now, watch this. How would you make up your ad on television to advertise your store? Okay, let me answer it for you because I don't want you to answer it. I want to answer it the way we've been answering that question as religious people. You go on television and say, hello everybody, I own fantastic shoe stores. And this is the door. It's a golden door, a silver handle, nice frame around it, beautiful door. The door is made of pure cedar wood with depth, covered with linseed oil. It's a fantastic, it's six feet high, it's four feet wide. It's a door you won't believe. It's a beautiful door, the door is fantastic. It's a strong door, it's a powerful door. The door is wonderful. Thank you. And the ad is over. Now I'm sitting there and I'm supposed to be getting shoes. I wonder if you all understand what I just said. That's what we're doing. So the ad goes off and I still don't know what you were selling. I'm sure there's a beautiful door. I got that point. It's a very expensive door. You got me convinced of that. I'm not looking for a door. But how do you advertise? You come back on television and you say, look, if you want your feet to be dressed in class, to feel like a queen and king when you walk the streets of the city, then we've got these pair of golden slippers here sparkling when the sunlight kisses them. Look at that. When you wear them, people bow and dignify your steps. They are wondering, who are you? And men, we've got golden boots here. These are fantastic. When you put them on, they feel like they're hugging your feet. And then when you walk on them, they massage your, your, your unders so that you become more stimulated. These boots, they can fit you every. You've got ten sizes to fit all from zero to ten. And I mean, you, fit, uh, you see, now watch this. When you go off, I want the boots. Guess what? I'm going to find the door. Jesus never preached himself to the public. But you got to go study again and check that out. I had to repent many times. 
from what I was preaching. He never preached himself. He preached. Look. <laughs> he said, this place, look at it. He said, this place got everything in it. Once you get in, everything you've been working hard for is already in the thing. You can actually sell all you've been accumulating and just get this one thing because everything that you've been working and pursuing is in this one thing called the kingdom. Look at the next one. The kingdom of heaven is like what? Treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he ran and sold what? He sold what? All. He sold what? All that he had possessed. And he bought that one field. What he's saying is, look, this man was working, just like a laborer, weeding someone's yard. He hit something. And when he dug it up, it was treasure. He looked this way and that way, covered it up. Went home and sold his car, his CD, his house, his wife, his dog. <laughs> VCR, whole works. Took all the money and bought it back. Tell the guy, I just want that little piece of property right there. Now the guy probably thought the man was crazy. Let me explain what that feels like. It's like giving up your entire theology that you worked for all your life to protect just to accept the kingdom today. That's tough. And people will say to you, are you crazy? You went to that conference to Pastor Gary and everything I taught you for the last 50 years you are telling me is not real anymore? You selling all of that for that one thing called the kingdom? Jesus said to do it. Why? Because everything you've been searching for and using your religion to try to find is in this one thing called the kingdom. Now here's the verse that I was warning you about. And the one I think will answer your question about the associations of Jesus. This is the verse I wish was not in the Bible. This is the verse I told you about that I was afraid to read and I didn't read yesterday because I wasn't sure you could handle it. This is the verse that could destroy your entire theology and wipe out most of what you've been preaching. This is the verse that I am afraid to show any bishop, any apostle, any pastor, because this verse destroyed me. Are you ready for it? Turn to Luke 16. Help me, Jesus. I'm so glad I'm leaving town tomorrow. You see, you cannot stone me. And I'm so glad I got my own jet now. <laughs> so you don't got to pay for my ticket. Are you ready? Okay. This is a tough verse. This is the verse that the pastors and the bishops and the theologians keep ignoring because it is not conducive to their theology. It says, Jesus is speaking. Who's speaking? Jesus. Who's speaking? This is not Paul. This is not Peter. This is Christ. He says, the law and the prophets were proclaimed or preached until what? John. Now don't read this verse too fast. He says, the law and the prophets were preached until John. In other words, up to John, from Moses to John, the preaching was on two subjects. The law and the prophets. All the prophecies, you preach the prophets. You preach the prophecies. They were fine, he said. They were fine. The law was preached, everything good until John. John stopped everything. Read the next statement. Since that time. See, you don't want to read this verse. This verse is destructive. Jesus is shutting down the Old Testament. 
See, that verse is dangerous. Don't look at me. Read the verse. No, look at the verse in the Bible. Look at it. Let him talk to you. Take a deep breath. I present to you Jesus. Since John, he says, the message that is being preached is what? The kingdom of God. And everyone is forcing his way into this kingdom. They're trying to get in. Oh dear. You know, I could end this meeting right now and just go home and let you go and deal with that verse before God. You, 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 you really have to deal with this. What do you do with that verse? Pastor, what do you do with that verse? That's a tough thing. I wish this was not on tape so I could take a chance to say something. But who cares? What Jesus just said is this. You are not supposed to get your material for preaching from the Old Testament. Read that. He didn't say that the Old Testament was wrong, incorrect, or invalid. He said it was fulfilled. We read in from Daniel yesterday. Remember Daniel? Daniel talked about what? This man who went into the presence of the ancient of days and bought out a kingdom. And, and he gave it to who? The saints. Okay? Jesus says, guess what? It's done. That's what the verse says. It's done. Whatever John, Daniel prophesied, it's done. Every prophecy. Now, this is a tough one. Every prophecy in the Old Testament, according to Jesus, not Miles Monroe, has been fulfilled. If that verse is true. So we're only supposed to use the Old Testament for reference. <laughs> I know, Steve, it's rough. So all those great preachings you hear, I want to talk to you about Daniel in the lion's den. That's not the kingdom. I want to preach about the three Hebrew boys. That's not the kingdom gospel. Now I know these are good stories and we get excited and we shout in big meetings. Yeah, preach it brother. But that's not what you're supposed to be preaching. He says, since that time, the good news of the kingdom is preached. Since John. See, John was an interesting fellow. John was the only guy who had one foot in the Old Testament, one foot in the New Testament. That blank page in your Bible between Malachi and Matthew, that's John. <laughs> now, Jesus said, there's no greater prophet than John. John is greater than Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehemiah, Baca, Zephaniah, Zechariah, he's greater than all of them. Why? He's greater than them, Jesus said, because they all talked about the thing coming. But John introduced it and shook his hand. He saw the king. He saw the kingdom in the king. And yet Jesus said, the least in the kingdom is greater than John. Why? Because even though John saw it, he never got in it.
you are in it. Now. Let me read another scripture. Make sure we balance all of this. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus began his ministry in Matthew chapter 5. First public message, the attitudes to be. <laughs> now, if you read this verse, you'll see this concept showing up in this statement again. Uh, verse 17 of chapter 5, out loud together. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. There it is. He says, they did their job, and the kingdom is here, and the king is here now. Listen, I give you a few, I mean, just so many more scriptures. You remember when he met the guys at the road to Emmaus? Some of you forgot about the whole story. Go back and read the story. He's walking with these guys for hours, right? And the Bible told us what he was doing. It says, and he taught them a Bible lesson, and then he's teaching them that, Showing that all the prophets and the laws were about him and the kingdom. Amen. That was that last Bible study with them was to prove that the whole Old Testament was about him. So if he's arrived, then the Old Testament has done its job. Amen. Now let's get on with the kingdom. Do you know what we're doing? We are preaching the past as the future. Help me, Jesus. It's rough. Oh, by the way, now someone asked me last night, did, did Paul preach the kingdom? Uh, you say Jesus didn't preach Calvary. Did, didn't Paul say, uh, preach Jesus Christ and him crucified? Again, I trust that you are hermeneutic students. Don't read a scripture and make it doctrine. Read context. Paul again was arguing with Judaizers. So don't quote that as being confirmation that Paul preached, uh, preached uh, uh, the crucifixion and Calvary. Watch this. Turn with me to the book of Acts. Last chapter. He kind of gives you Paul's focus. I could give you 20 other scriptures from Paul. But I thought this one might help you. Acts 28. Everybody got it? Verse 30 and 31. Out loud. Go. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached. What? I rest my case. And then, read the last statement, he taught about Jesus Christ. He didn't preach the door first. I know it's good. It took me 30 years to make all my mistakes. Still trying to correct them. Since that time, the kingdom is preached. Now, this statement, and everyone is forcing his way into it, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than the least of the stroke of pen to be dropped from the law, etc. He's saying, look, everything that the law and the prophets prophesied fulfilled in me. Oh, I promised to connect you to Moses and Elijah, didn't I? Okay. Look at this verse. Two statements. Jesus concluded the, New, the Old Testament in just two words, law, prophets. And that is all the Old Testament is. It's about the law and the prophecies. And all of them are about him. Look at me. Would you follow this? So now, sit tight, pass again. So now Jesus is on earth, right? And he comes to do what? To fulfill, to conclude everything. So he calls a final meeting. He takes three of his friends to the meeting. 
final meeting now. He's about to tell these two things, the law and the prophets. Thank you. You're finished. Go. Kingdom is taken over now. So he calls a meeting with these two guys, with these two things, law and prophets. <laughs> he said, Peter, James, and John, I want you all to witness this because I need some humans to witness that this thing is closed. And he goes upon this mountain. And the Bible says he was transfigured before their eyes. And two men showed up. Not Abraham. One was what? Moses. Other was who? Elijah. Why? Because Moses represents the law. And Elijah represents what? The prophets. And he's what? The Bible says, and he was talking with them. I don't know what they were saying, but I got a hunch. Moses, you did a good job, buddy. Thank you so much. You gave him the written code. You gave him all the details. But now, I'm going to give him the spirit of the law. Elijah did a great job. You told him about me. All the prophets got their spirit from you. Matter of fact, that's why every time somebody caught the spirit of, of Christ, prophecy, they would say, that's Elijah come back. Because you did a good job. You, you really showed the power of the kingdom of God. Thanks so much for representing the prophets. And I want to thank you all. You did your job. You may now leave. Now, while they're closing the meeting, Peter says, let's build three religions. Let's maintain the law. Let's maintain the prophecies. And then we'll build one for Jesus. The voice from heaven heard that foolishness. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. And God says, what is this? And God shut the meeting down. And he gave instructions to the men. He said, look. The Bible says, and Moses and Elijah vanished. And Jesus was there alone. And the voice said unto them, this is now my son. Hear him only. What did he preach? See, I told you, he said. If you want to preach prophecy, preach revelations. When it comes to kingdom and to Christ, it's in the kingdom. Let's talk about some more confirmation about Jesus and the, and the kingdom. The purpose for the resurrection. This is tough. I'm going to get in trouble, but who cares? All right. The culmination of the redemptive work of God was what? The resurrection. That's what you think. And you've been taught that. You know, the greatest event of Jesus is the resurrection. That's not true. I used to think that also. And I used to preach that. But that is not true. Let's read some scripture. Acts 1. Jesus has been raised from the dead. According to scripture references, he went to Hades, went down into Sheol, went to Gehenna, picked up some keys, came back. Rose again the third day. And he spent, what, 40 days meeting with these guys. My question is, read this in your Bible, turn your Bible, please. I want you to read this in your Bible. What does he do for these 40 days? What's he been doing for these? What does he do? Now... <clears throat> <laughs> oh man this is deep I need to take a deep breath myself <sighs> okay what did Jesus preach before he died what was his message come on answer me oh you're afraid to say it what did Jesus preach before he died 
What did he preach every day? What did he preach all the time? Okay. Because he said that's why he came. Now we're going to read what he preached after he went to hell. Rose again with the keys. Read it. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave them convincing proofs that he was alive. No problem. And then he appeared to them over what? A period of 40 days and he spoke to them about the same old crazy message that's in your Bible. What are you preaching? You're on target, my son. Stay positioned. God's going to confirm everything you do. God is only obligated to confirm his word. So if you preach his word, he is obligated to show up. That's all Jesus preached, even after the resurrected body. The disciples must have been tired of that message. What do you think? They were tired of that message. All day before he died, kingdom. He come back from the dead, kingdom. And that's how you feel. You've been hearing it for the last three days. And you figure, why don't you preach on prosperity? Preach on faith? Preach on deliverance? No, that's not the gospel. That's what Christianity preaches. That's not what kingdom preaches. Don't you hate the fact that I could show you scriptures to prove this? I mean, you want to argue with me so badly, I can feel it. You pastors want to say, you're wrong, but you can't argue that. That's your problem. I know, you see, the battle is on between your ears right now. Matter of fact, you're thinking now, what am I going to preach when I get home? My answer, buy all my tapes and do what I did. I burned a lot of tapes. I had to go back to my tape department and told them, from this year back, burn it. Nothing is worse than self-deception. What are we preaching? It gets worse. Watch this. <laughs> Acts 1 verse 6. Now you got to find these in the Bible. I don't want you to tell anybody I said. Acts 1 verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore what? The kingdom to who? Israel. These guys are what? Nationalists. They were nationalistic. They were only thinking about their nation and their group of people and their little piece of property. Watch him now. He's going to answer them. The kingdom is not limited, watch this, to a national government. That's what the point I wrote, I wrote this here. But it is invisible. And it is from a country that is invisible of, called heaven. And God wants that country to impact earth. These guys were thinking only about their own nation. Now this is important because even after the resurrection, now you see why he had to teach the kingdom. Because they still didn't get it. Right. And that's why in verse 8 he says, go back to Jerusalem. Go, 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 go. And you wait there. And I will ignite the power. And you will be witnesses of me where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to all the earth. Why? Because you guys still thinking only about Israel. I am not Abraham's representation. I didn't come here just to get the land back. They think about the land. They Abraham seed. They got the Abraham contract. He said, no, I got the Adamic contract. I came for the whole planet. Yes. 
you know, we got offices in 17 countries. Before I die, I want an office in 180 countries. That's my dream, including Iran. Am I crazy? No. According to the contract, the whole world is the Lord's. You're trying to build a church in your little neighborhood with a steeple and a bell to bury people and christen babies. And he's thinking about you setting up a catalyst to impact the whole globe. You're no different from these disciples. I used to pray, give me the city. The Lord says, boy, you got a small mind. Don't try to be a good church in Tulsa. Tulsa ain't big enough for you. I prophesy. If you think like God, God will make you look like him. They ask me for the nations. All right, let me tap into some keys. The power of kingdom keys. Everybody say keys. keys. Understanding how the kingdom keys work. Write it down quick. We got to move fast because we only got one more night. Praise God. I'm so sorry. I need three more days, Pastor Gary, to really do a job on this. <laughs> All right. Write this down. One earth, two worlds. That's what this whole thing is about. There's only one earth, but there are two worlds on this earth. The word world, write it down, is the word cosmos. K-O-S-M-O-S. Those of you who are scholars know about this. K-O-S-M-O-S. Everybody say cosmos. cosmos. Not C, not K. That's the Greek word that's used in the Bible in the New Testament. Now, the word cosmos means governing authority. Write it down. Governing what? Authority. It also means system of control. Write all these down, please. System of what? Control. Thirdly, the word cosmos also means powers, powers, plural, of influence. <laughs> and was it cosmos? Cosmos. Speaking Greek, good. Now, look at the definitions. Look at them again. Read them to yourself. Okay. Guess what? That word cosmos is what is translated in the Bible as world. Write it down. World. So put all three of those under one heading. World. So what is world in the Bible? Cosmos. World is governing system, governing authority. What else? System of control and power of influence. Right. That's the word world. So when Jesus goes into all the world, he's not talking about the earth. <laughs> he says, be in the world, but not of. He said, you can be in the system, but don't become the system. talking now he said the way this system works yours don't work there is another world that has entered the earth the earth had one world when adam sinned and that was the world of darkness it the systems of darkness satanic controls control the whole earth the earth is neutral the earth is always pure the earth is good that's why the earth is still the lord's nothing wrong with the earth it's the powers that manage it. The governing what? Authorities. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you got to listen to me. That's why when Isaiah was prophesying about Jesus, we missed it. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given. And he's coming with the government. He's bringing a new system. He's restoring the original influence power. 
He's bringing back the original dominion and fluence. Yes. That's why now I want you to hear me. God sent me to you. Because you are in the midst of a battle of ideas. Yes. They, are, they are coming after the heart of the religious church. And they are going to ordain homosexual pastors, priests, bishops. They are coming after the religion. And they are going to win. Mark my words. It's a battle of ideas. And religion cannot fight ideas. But the kingdom is not a religion. It's a government. And there's a government attacking a religion right now. That's why in Alabama, the government attacked a judge and made him move a piece of stone. Or whatever that was. And everybody's upset. Listen, you don't understand. It's a battle for the ideas. But we needed to change our position. We got to position ourselves now as a government. And now it's government against government. When they asked Jesus, listen, this is going to help you, okay? When they asked Jesus, when he was casting out a demon, they said, you are full of the devil. Belzebub is your name. You got the prince of demons. Now, Jesus, hi, 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 hi. this was religious people talking to him. Christ shifted into kingdom. He said, look, you guys are so stupid. You don't fight the devil with religion. You missed the whole argument he was given. He says, look, <laughs> no kingdom divided. He didn't say no religion divided. Oh, my God. Get it. He says, I ain't dealing with no religion here. The devil ain't interested in no religion. Religion is keeping you dumb and stupid. He says, the devil don't want you to ever understand kingdom. Yes. Oh, yes. His conclusion. He concluded the argument by saying, if I cast this demon out, by the power of God, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon earth. Do you know why you can't cast out demons? You're praying in the name of religion. Demons do not respect religion. Religion has no power. It has form. Rituals. If I cast this demon out of this man by the finger of God, then the kingdom has arrived. Because only kingdoms destroy kingdoms. Two worlds, one earth. Be not conformed to this now take the word world out and put those sentences in. Ready? Go. Be not conformed to this governing authority, system of control, powers of influence, but be ye transformed by what? Renewing of the mind. Now stop right there. Write the word renew down. Write it down. Quick, quick, quick. Renew. Now write it again, but separate the prefix. Re dash new. Re means to go backward to the original. Got it. 
He said, look, the only way to fight the system is to get reconnected to the original system of government, which was the one Adam lost in the garden, which was the dominion kingdom power of God. He said, if you don't get the kingdom, the devil going to swallow you up. Jesus, Lord, that's why Christianity ain't working for you. Have mercy on God. The fall of man was a fall from rulership, from government. God sent Jesus Christ to restore heaven's government rulership on earth through mankind. He came to bring what? A government. He came to bring what? A government. He came to bring what? A government. What was upon his shoulders? A government. He came to deliver to the saints what? A kingdom. The kingdom received, the citizens received what? A kingdom. He came to bring a governing authority. We keep making it a religion. Write this down. The assignment of Jesus, therefore, was to reintroduce the kingdom, rulership, government of God to earth. All these scriptures, please read them. They'll help you out as you go along. The last statement, the goal of God was to never have a religion, but rulership through mankind, a relationship. Very important statement, that last one. Write it down, put it on the, in your mirror to see it every morning. That last statement is important. The goal of God was never religion, but rulership through relationship. God wanted a family, not a religion. He wanted citizens, not religious people. He wanted sons, not servants. He wanted heirs, not hirelings. You see, we, we got to get the concepts right. God is not your boss. He's your father. Religion makes him your boss. Are you getting it? It's a battle for ideas. It's a battle for ideas. Do you know what God sent her to save you? An idea. Do you know what the word word means? Logos. Do you know what the word logos means? Expression of an idea. Come on, you scholars, you know the word. Look it up in the dictionary. The word word in John 1 is the word logos, L-O-G-O-S. It means expression of an idea. Jesus was God's idea in a body. (laughs) And he came to destroy the ideas of the devil. As a man think it? So if I got to affect the man, I got to affect the way he thinks. That's why God didn't send power to earth. He sent a word. Because word are ideas containers. Take a look at this. Kingdom citizens. Oh, I love this one. Please get the tapes, please. Because I can't get into details. Kingdom citizens of two worlds. Do you know it's possible to have dual citizenship? Some of you may have it. Dual citizenship means that you are a part of two different countries. Write this down. Heaven is a country. (laughs) For the lack of a better term. The greatest gift God ever sent to earth was a kingdom, not a religion. The greatest message delivered by Jesus was about a kingdom, not about religion. And the greatest need of mankind is a kingdom, not a, not a religion. Man needs a new government. Yes. Right now, none of our governments are working, including yours. Bush cannot protect you from terrorism right now. So you better get under a new system fast. And this is, this is going to become more serious than you think. There's no guarantee that you are safe in the mall. I listened to CNN this morning, and I heard a statement that made me tremble. One of the 
the reps from Washington said. We have no way of telling where they are. Condoleezza Rice last night was being interviewed by Larry King. She's, Larry says, how many terrorists are in America right now? Do you know? He said, give me a figure. Is it 50, 100? She says, we don't know. She says, it, it's in the thousands. He said, where are they? We don't know. That's your national security leader. That's why you need to connect with a government that put personal guards with you all the time. That will not allow you to dash your foot against a stone. And they'll watch over that which concerned you to keep you in all. You better get out of religion and get into the kingdom. The kingdom is a government. kingdom is real, real to me. When I sit on an airplane, I always assign angels to the plane. And I go to work. I fly more than all of thee. Never had a mishap. The most stable kingdom on earth is not America. It's the kingdom of God. What did God say? It will last forever and ever and ever. That means no matter how large Islam grows, the kingdom will never be overtaken by no religion. Islam may overtake Christianity, but it will never overtake the kingdom. Glory. Yes. Hallelujah. The kingdom, what is it? The kingdom is the practical spiritual influence of God in our daily com contemporary life. Practical influence. Why? That's what governing world is. It's the influence of powers on the territory. The kingdom of God is living under the laws of another government. The government of heaven. <laughs> Do you get it? It is so simple. Yes, it is. Do you know that I am from the Bahamas where God lives? In my bag, I have a, a passport. Do you know what my passport says? Now, you want to go home and read this for yourself in your own passport. Passports do not belong to citizens. Did you know that? Passports are property of the government. And when you get a passport, you become property of the government. That's what citizenship is all about. Citizenship is giving yourself over to an authority. Passport always reads the bearer of this passport is property of the government now the bible says your citizenship is in heaven so you don't read this stuff and believe it <laughs> so that means even though you are here see me I'm, i happen to be in america right now but my citizenship is in the bahamas and i got my passport with me to prove it now, even though I am in America, I am under the authority of the Bahamas. If you were to harm me, my government would be activated. You don't understand citizenship. When those two girls were held in Afghanistan. See, you don't understand. Just two, two girls no one knew. But when the report came, everybody say phone call. When the phone call came to Washington, to the White House, and said there are two girls locked up in another government's prison. Ah! Bush say, Marines, Navy, Army. Y'all don't understand what happened that day. He's every ship, head to.
to what area? Why? Somebody's messing with the citizens. Oh, I feel like preaching, but it's 12 o'clock. Ah! That's real. He bought a government. Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus said, look, if anyone, he said, if anyone offends the least of my citizens, it is better for him to tie a rope around his neck and tie a stone on the other end and commit suicide before my government comes to him. You ought to give him a praise this morning. I say you ought to give him a praise this morning. Citizenship. That's citizenship. 